Grace and peace to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt, President of the Institute of Lutheran Theology, and it's wonderful to be with you today on this snowy day in Brookings, South Dakota. Our lesson this morning uh, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Greeks and Jews, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. In order that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here ends the reading. Most merciful God, we ask your blessing here this day upon our gathering. Let your word be heard. In the name of the risen Lord, amen. John D. Rockefeller had three simple rules for anyone wanting to get rich. Go to work early, stay at work late, and find oil. <laughs> what he says is apt. Rockefeller recognized that in a very real sense, financial success is grace. People often misunderstand this, thinking that working hard entails financial success. They fail, in fact, to distinguish between necessary and sufficient conditions. Consider this statement. If it rains, the sidewalk gets wet. Here, it raining is sufficient for the sidewalk getting wet. In, if x, then y, x is sufficient for y. Now, notice that while raining is sufficient for the sidewalk getting wet, it is not necessary. Sidewalks can get wet in myriad, divers, and sundry ways. Can you think of some? Yes, there are dogs. But while rain is not necessary, for the sidewalk getting wet, it turns out the sidewalk getting wet is necessary for it raining. This seems confusing at first, but the logic is impeccable. If x then y, then y is necessary for x. If it is true that if it rains the sidewalk gets wet, then it cannot rain without the sidewalk getting wet. That is to say, the sidewalk getting wet is necessary for it to be raining. While raining is a sufficient condition for the sidewalk getting wet, the sidewalk getting wet is a necessary condition for it raining. It's all standard logic. I taught it for years. Now let's take a slightly more controversial example by way of excursus. Good works are necessary for salvation. 
What this says is that it is not the case that one has salvation but does not do good works. That is, act accordingly. It clearly does not say that if one does good works, one will gain salvation. Arguments among mid-16th century Lutheran theologians sometimes proceeded as if good works are necessary for salvation could be understood as if one does good works, one will acquire salvation. But this violates the very logic of the phrase, necessary for. Now, back to the example at hand. We sometimes misunderstand the logic of it is necessary to work hard to succeed, as if it were meaning it is sufficient to work hard to succeed. But while it may be necessary to work hard in order to have success, such work is clearly not sufficient for achieving success. The statement should be, if you achieve success, you will have worked hard. Not if you work hard, you will achieve success. While Rockefeller knew that if you have success, you will have worked hard, he recognized that something other than working hard must be present if success is to be had. Maybe a little luck. He found the oil. There are clearly those, after all, however, who scarcely work hard and are yet independently wealthy. Some inherit vast wealth, some just luck out completely. Some, like Bill Gates, happen to be at the right place at the right time. While we can perhaps in general make some progress towards wealth by working hard, incredible wealth can never be earned. Rockefeller could be wrong. After all, it may not be that hard work is necessary for success after all. But clearly, something other than pure raw luck is necessary for success. Even the guy that wins the lotto has to buy a ticket after all. Great riches are grace. They don't follow from working hard. Nothing in our power can produce vast wealth. But vast wealth does not appear in our lives apart from our participation. It might be helpful to list some of the properties of worldly wealth. I can think of four. Number one, it can't be earned. It can't be gotten through our own efforts entirely. Having wealth, number two, makes you not poor anymore. Right? Seems clear. Three, Having wealth makes you popular, at least in some circles, maybe unpopular in others. And wealth only lasts until death. Four. Now let's consider the riches of God and how they compare with financial riches. What is meant by the phrase riches of God? Well, we go to Romans 2, 4. It identifies riches with kindness, forbearance and patience. Romans 11.13 speaks of God's riches as God's wisdom. Ephesians 1.7 equates such riches with God's grace. And Ephesians 2.4 links divine riches to divine mercy. Accordingly, God's riches include grace, mercy, and wisdom. And how do these riches compare to worldly riches? Well, there are some similarities, like worldly riches, divine riches can't be earned. But on the other issues here, the other aspects, there are differences. Unlike worldly riches, one can have the riches of God and still be poor of the Spirit. We Lutherans know, after all, that we have such riches when we are sinful. Unlike human riches, divine riches don't make one popular. Right? Finally, while human wealth stops at death, divine riches last far beyond death. Clearly, while God's riches are grace, they don't follow from our working hard to get them. Now, according to our reading in 1 Corinthians, one of the riches of God is wisdom. And this wisdom is real, even though it looks foolish. 
The distinction between appearance and reality goes way back in the history of philosophy. Plato really worked with this distinction, of course, and St. Paul employs it here. While God's wisdom is real, even though it looks foolish to the world, the wisdom of the world is mere appearance, even though it looks real. Nothing is more foolish than the cross of Christ. In fact, it can only be folly to most of the world's people, for most of the world's people are perishing. No oil. Yet the foolishness of God is more powerful than the wisdom of men and women, and the wisdom of God more powerful than the foolishness of human beings. Clearly, God's gift often appears under what seems to be God's opposite. In the medieval tradition, it was called subcontrario, underneath the opposite. Moreover, God chooses the foolish, another Latin phrase, quorum hominibus, before human beings, as it looks before human judgment, the presence of human beings. He chooses the foolish, quorum hominibus, to confound the wise. He chooses weak, what is weak, quorum hominibus, to confound the strong. Because God works underneath his opposite, no one can boast in God's presence, right? Though we have no wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, God gifts them to us anyway in Christ. That's what verse 30 was about. These are the true riches of God. Just as finding oil is a gift, so too are our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. They are gifts as well. God donates them all through Christ. And, of course, God inverts our expectations. Think of the gospel reading this morning, which I did not read. But you'll be reading it and hearing it next weekend when you're in church. Jesus is driving the people, the moneylenders, out of the temple, you remember. It's from John. Now, Jesus found these people selling cattle, sheep, and doves. And he was upset by this, but of course this was to be expected that they would sell these things because this was the system, this was the sacramental system, and you had to go do this in order to buy the thing to sacrifice, and it was all very reasonable, very rational. And yet Jesus comes in, while the system was reasonable uh, in Jesus' time, Jesus battles against this reasonable system, against reasonable expectations. He makes a whip of cords, and he drives the sellers out of the temple. We somehow think that it was wrong, you know, but I mean, you have to understand it in its time. He goes against expectations when he says, of course, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Clearly, Jesus is going against expectations about what a temple is. When I was in high school and I first went to college, I did not much like Corinthians 18 to 31. 1 Corinthians, uh, this chapter. I did much not like the talk of foolishness of faith and the things divine. I didn't like that much. I did not like to think that Christianity was foolish, after all, because I didn't want to be foolish. I did not like to think about it as some sort of leap into the absurd. I f knew far too many people, thought I, who closed their eyes and ears to the intellectual problems of the faith. I did not see foolishness as a virtue. Now, in my sixth decade of life, I am not longer concerned about the putative, rational grounds for faith. For me, the question has become the attitude we assume when we assume and look for rational grounds for faith. We always seem somehow to end up thinking that rationality is sufficient for faith, that if we think hard enough we will come to faith, that if we reflect deeply enough about our existential conditions, we will find the answer, and it's got to be the Christian answer. It's all to be expected, after all. If we reflect deeply enough, we will understand who Jesus is and what Jesus does. But just as Rockefeller's work was not sufficient for his wealth, so is my reason and perspective not sufficient for finding Christ at the center of my life. 
for finding that Jesus is my Savior and Redeemer. Something more is needed. This something more is grace, of course. Grace that comes to you and me from the outside. Grace that carries the Holy Spirit as on the wings of a dove. It is this grace that grants us life eternal. Yet be not duped. Grace is not merely sufficient for salvation, at least not for most of us. Other means are necessary. Grace comes to us, after all, in our struggle to find life in the midst of the experience of fate and death, to find forgiveness in the midst of our experience of guilt and condemnation, and to find meaning in the midst of our experience of emptiness and meaninglessness. We struggle, we seek, we doubt, and we run away. And it is in these activities of our daily life that our Savior pursues us and finds us. Are you wise or foolish? This is not a question that one can answer in the abstract. It is answered only in the hearing of his life-giving word, these words, I love you and accept you despite that you are unacceptable to me or yourselves. I heal you in your sickness unto death. I find you in your abandonment of me. I adopt you as my only, as my own precious child though you are but an insignificant wisp in a universe of unimaginable immensity and duration. I give you eternal life, though time itself will someday cease. I prepare for you a mansion and a place that cannot hold one. This is what I do for you, my sons and daughters. Can you hear me? It is perhaps wise to work, but foolish to expect much out of it. This is good prudence for life. But God overturns all easy calculation. As it turns out, human wisdom is necessary, but never sufficient for our experience of divine foolishness. And human foolishness is necessary, but never sufficient for our experience of divine wisdom. This interrelationship is the porous membrane through which God sends us his gifts. So may you find oil. It is there. Work hard, but know where it is, is where it is. This is the good news today that I proclaim to you. God's grace is where it is. And God's grace is abundant for all who search. Now may God's grace that is always where it is find you in this day. Amen. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we are human beings. You are God. We are here. You are there. We are finite. You are infinite. Give us a deep sense of the meaning of these words. Let us know that distance which translates into your presence. Let us know your law which can come to us as grace. Most merciful God, we ask today that your blessing 
be upon all of those who are suffering in this world, world, martyrs for the faith, who in their final breaths proclaim that you are Lord. Lord God, you have emboldened us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not the temptation, but us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.